everyone, and welcome back to Joey's Retro Handhelds. I'm Joey, and today I've created the ultimate setup guide for your brand new Ambernic RG405M. Fair warning, this is a long video, but I've timestamped everything, so feel free to jump around to see what you want to see. However, if you're new to Android and want the best experience, I'd suggest watching from the beginning to see how I've set up my device. A lot of my guide is a combination from different sources. My experiences, settings from Russ at Retro Game Corps, some from Retro Tech Dad, and others, but hopefully this helps give you a full setup of the RG405M. Another warning, for PS2, GameCube, Wii, and 3DS, I'm going to show the basic settings to get many games working, but you'll have to do some digging on your end to find the best settings for certain games. I'm basically showing the safe defaults. Same thing with changing native resolutions on all emulators. Feel free to experiment with that setting on your end. Okay, screen protector install is over, let's move on to the good stuff. First thing we're going to do is remove all the default apps, emulators, and folders. Everything we can. Why? Well, first you'll notice these apps don't even update in the Play Store, so unless you want to manually update them later, save the time now. Second, I just don't like having this all preset up for me and feel weird about paid apps being on here without me having bought them to support the devs. Follow along with my steps to essentially de-bloat and prepare the device for us to customize it. Yes, we're even deleting the folders for the apps and emulators we've removed. And you better believe we're cleaning up the home screen, which considering we're going to be setting up a front end that replaces this later, it's a bit unnecessary, but still, I like to be thorough. Let's go through the Android settings menu and change some things. First, let's get the battery percentage on the top right. Now, let's get rid of some of the annoying sounds. Let's turn on adaptive brightness, even though I don't think it actually does anything. And I like setting my screen timeout to 30 minutes, which is basically never. And let's save our eyes with dark mode. Moving on, fix your time zone. I'm in Alberta, Canada, so Edmonton time for me. Sorry for the next part, I was still in light mode while filming and things got shifted around. Alright. We have a clean slate, let's move on to the Play Store and first update the existing apps that are left. Now let's start installing our own apps and emulators, Solid File Explorer first. Now Drastic, which is a paid app for Nintendo DS emulation. PPSSPP for PSP emulation. DuckStation Standalone for PlayStation 1 emulation. Forgot to film this part, but I'd suggest removing Chrome the same way we did all the other apps and installing Firefox with uBlock Origin to remove ads. 
Let's get AutoSync for Google Drive on here as well. This allows us to sync our saves across devices. Check out my other video on this to learn more on how to do so. For Nintendo 64, we're going to be using the M64 Plus FC emulator. I use the Pro version, but free works as well. It's right next to it. Yaba Sanshiro 2 Pro for Sega Saturn, again, also has a free version. And lastly, Redream for a Sega Dreamcast. Moving on to PlayStation 2, either SX2 is the emulator of choice, and since the Play Store version has ads now, I'll be grabbing the APK from APK Mirror, version 3668 is a good one. Follow my steps to get it on your device. Let's head back into the Play Store, search for either SX2, and uncheck Auto Updates to avoid getting the ad version as well. Okay, the big one, RetroArch. I'm going to be headed to the RetroArch website and downloading the 64-bit APK, staying away from the Play Store version. This was pre-Firefox, so you can see there's a ton of ads on the screen. Do the same steps with RetroArch that you did with either SX2 to disable Play Store updating. Open the RetroArch app. Once you're into RetroArch, the first thing we're going to do is fix this UI. Push right twice on the D-pad or click the settings cog on the right. Head to user interface and change menu scale factor to 0.85x, which looks nice to me, but feel free to set it to whatever works for you. Okay, now let's set up retro achievements, or skip if you're not interested, disable hardcore mode if you are. Head over to on-screen display, uncheck display overlay to remove touchscreen buttons. Use the B button to back out, go to notifications and then visibility, turn on frame rate if you'd like. Back out to the settings menu, head to saving and select auto save state and load save state automatically. Auto save state saves your state when you close RetroArch and load, well, it loads you when you open RetroArch. Back out, head over to input, turn off confirm quit, it'll get annoying if we don't. Head to hotkeys. I use select as my hotkey, which is the button you have to hold down for the rest of the items on this menu. So for quit, I set it to start. To quit a game, I push select plus start at the same time. For fast forward, I set it to R1, so select plus R1 at the same time toggles fast forward. To show the RetroArch menu, I set it to X, so select X shows the menu. Save state is R2, and load state is L2. Back out again and head to Online Updater, Core Downloader, and now let's get some cores. Final Burn Neo, Gambate, MGBA, Nestopia, SNES 9X Current, Flycast, and Genesis Plus GX are the cores that I'm going to be installing. Back out, scroll down and update core info files, update assets, update controller profiles, update cheats, update databases, and update overlays. Let them finish before you exit RetroArch, cheats takes forever. Head back to settings, input, and select port 1 controls. Change this to left analog to let us use the left stick for games. 
Now let's set up the controller mapping. I use Nintendo's layout personally. After this, A and B are likely to be swapped for you right now, so let's fix that. Back out one menu, go to menu controls, and uncheck menu swap OK and cancel buttons. Should be back in business now. Back out to the settings menu, then D-pad right once, or select the home icon on the right to get to the RetroArch home menu. Head to configuration file, and save configuration to save all of our changes. We're done with RetroArch, let's move on to Redream. Open the app, and click light mode unless you've bought premium to upscale your games. Click go to library and select your Dreamcast ROB library. Head to the video tab and turn on frame rate counter and vertical sync. Now go to the input tab and start mapping your controls. Some fields are best wiped first, like the triggers and main menu. For main menu, I mapped it to the menu button. We're done with Redream, let's move on to Yaba Sanshiro 2. Open the Yaba Sanshiro 2 app, click start and decline the sign in. Go to the sidebar top left and select settings. Select or not forced Android TV mode, it doesn't matter really. Select game directory and go to your Saturn ROM directory and click OK. Uncheck Use CPU Affinity, Show FPS, scroll down to Sound Time Synchronization Mode and select Real Time, head down to Choose Input Device and pick Retro Game Underscore Joypad. Then select Edit Key Map, now map your controls for Saturn. Going off Retro Game Corps here, as I'm not a Saturn player really, he says to use YBA for ABC and L1, X, R1 for XYZ. We're done with Yabba Sanchiro 2, let's move on to Aether SX2. Open the Aether SX2 app, leave the default here as optimal, import your BIOS and then select it. Also add your PS2 ROM directory and let it scan and add your games. Now let's jump into the app settings menu. I'm going to turn off fastboot as I like the nostalgia of the PS2 BIOS, but this is your preference. Select save state on shutdown, this works the same as the RetroArch setting from earlier. And then select landscape as the orientation. Show FPS if you'd like. Pop over the system tab and we're going to set a 50 cycle rate. As well as a maximum cycle skip. Head over to the graphics tab and change OpenGL to Vulkan. And again, the achievements tab to set up retro achievements if you'd like. Now back out to the main menu and select controller settings and go to the touchscreen settings to disable the touchscreen controls. Now let's map the controls for PlayStation. The icons on the left are trolling, go by the text. Now scroll over to the Hotkeys tab. I set Toggle Fast Forward as L3. Scroll down and set the Menu button as the Pause menu. 
We're done with AetherSX2, let's move to DuckStation. Open the DuckStation app and allow file access, and click Yes to rebind your controller. Auto hide the touchscreen controller and head to port 1. Select analog controller and let's map buttons. Again, ignore the icons on the left and pay attention to the text. Scroll over to the Hotkeys tab and set the Menu button as the Pause menu, and then set Fast Forward as L3. Back out of the menu and select App Settings. Again, I'll be turning off Fast Boot as I like the nostalgia. Head to the Display tab and scroll down to turn on FPS. Then go to the Enhancements tab, and this is where you change the resolution if you'd want, but for now, let's turn on PGXP Geometry Correction. And then again, Achievements tab for Retro Achievements. After all that, get back to the sidebar menu and import your BIOS. Lastly, on the home page, add your PS1 ROM directory. We're done with DuckStation, let's move to M64 Plus FC. Open the M64 Plus FC app and head to the input section. Set Show In-Game Menu to Slide Gesture, and when in-game, drag your finger from the left side of the screen to open the emulator menu. Now go to the Profiles and Controller to set up our controllers. Copy the Android Gamepad profile and rename it to anything you want. Clear all the bindings and map N64 controls as you'd like. I use the right stick for C-Pad, but that doesn't work for all games, so just be aware that you may have to come back here and create a new profile. Now let's back out and head to the display menu, and this is where you change the resolution if you'd want to. I'm keeping it default. Back to the sidebar and select touchscreen. Set button opacity to 0 to remove touchscreen controls. Head to the main screen and add your N64 ROM directory. We're done with M64 Plus FC, let's move to PPSSPP. Open the PPSSPP app, and now we're going to create a folder on the internal storage for this app to save everything in. I called mine PPSSPP. After that, let's head to Settings and let's set PSP to 2 times resolution. Scroll all the way down and turn on the FPS counter. Head to the Controls tab on the left and turn off Touch Controls. Then go to Mapping to map our controls for PSP. My lizard brain started at Circle, feel free to start at D-Pad Up. Lastly, set Speed Toggle to L3 for toggling Fast Forward, then delete the map for Fast Forward if it exists on your device. We're done with PPSSPP, let's move to Drastic. Open the Drastic app and click OK and Allow. Jump into Options. Set Frame Skip to Manual and Value to 0. Fast Forward Maximum Speed set to Unlimited, and then High Resolution 3D Rendering to On. Back out and head to Virtual Gamepad and set Menu Button Position to Hidden.
Back out again and head to general and show FPS as well as autosave to every five minutes or whatever your preference is. Scroll all the way down and just like we did with PPSSPP, we need to create a folder for drastic. Mine is called drastic, original, I know. Exit out of drastic completely and come back in. Drastic is going to move all its files, let it delete its source data after moving. Head to external controller, select key mapping and select no mapping to create one. Go through and map for Nintendo DS controls and then click map special. I do L1 for screen swap, L3 for fast forward. Skip until open menu and then set that as the menu button. Skip again until half screen swap and set as R1. Skip till you're done and now an important note. For some reason, after doing this, your A and B buttons are both going to be set as OK in Drastic's menus. Neither are cancel, so use the touchscreen to move around the menus from here on out. Back out using the top left arrow twice to get to the Drastic main menu and click Load New Game. Click the plus sign top right to select your Nintendo DS ROM directory. Load up a game and push the menu button or use the navigation bar to show the exit menu. Then select menu and scroll down to select screen layout. Choose X colon one to get a big screen and small screen. Go back to that menu and this time click edit screens. Edit for X one, click the menu button bottom left and edit controller layout. This next part is a pain, but click each on screen button and uncheck on the left to hide. Click Apply and then Menu, Save as Global Layout. Repeat this process again for Landscape Aspect or any other layouts you want to use. We're done with Drastic, let's move to Adolphin MMJR. I'll leave a link for this APK in the description since it's a bit hard to find nowadays. Install the APK and open the Dolphin MMJR app. MMJR has been the most stable and best performing option for this device for me. Click the Settings cog general and copy all of the settings that you're going to see on screen. In the graphics tab, make sure you're using Vulkan and shader mode is set to asynchronous. In the enhancement tab is where you could change the resolution if you want. I'd leave it as 1x. Just go through one by one with what you see on screen to make sure your settings are the same. Back out to the main menu and go to GameCube input. Select controller one and emulated. Now map your controls for GameCube. I have what mine are on screen. When you're done, back out to the main menu screen and select Wii Input. Select Controller 1 and Emulated. Then select the classic controller extension. Now map your controls for Wii. You're likely going to have to map out for other extensions as well for some games, so keep that in mind. Click save top right and back out to the main screen. Select the NGC tab on the bottom row 
and click the plus icon to select your GameCube ROM directory. Then move to the Wii tab and click the plus icon to select your Wii ROM directory. For some reason, the app does not search subfolders, so keep that in mind. You may have to do each individual directory. Once that's all done, boot up a game and click your menu button and then select the settings cog. Emulated CPU clock speed is the setting you'll want to change for most games. I have it here at 70%, which has been working perfectly for Paper Mario Thousand Year Door, but play around for some of the games. We're done with Dolphin MMJR, let's move to Skyline Edge. Skyline Edge is Patreon exclusive, I'll include a link to the description for those that want it, this is version 62. Open the app and click the settings cog top right. Select search location and navigate to your Switch ROM directory. For production keys and title keys, you'll have to use Google for both. Scroll down and uncheck Use Docked Mode. Then show performance statistics. In this section, Executor Flush Threshold is going to be the option you'll adjust most. I have it set to 256. Feel free to play around with it if games aren't working. 1024 is also a good option. Head to the input section and configure controller 1. Disable the on screen controls. Now just map your controls for Switch. This is what mine looks like. We're done with Skyline Edge, let's move to Citra MMJ. I have a link in the description for Citra MMJ. Download it and open the app. I found MMJ to be the best option for Citra on this device. Click Add Folder to Library and find your 3DS ROM folder. Click the Settings cog top right and select Large Screen as your layout, or whatever your preference is. You can also change the resolution here. I'd also enable audio stretching. Back out and click Input Binding. Map your controls for 3DS. Then head back to the main screen and open a game. Click your menu button and select Edit Buttons. Easier than Drastic was, just touch each on-screen control to hide it. We're done with emulators, let's set up the Digisho front end. Head to the Play Store and install Digisho. When you open it, select the platforms you want and then click Import. L1, R1 let you navigate the top tabs, and L2, R2 are for platforms. Head to the Widget tab and add your Retro Achievements profile, and your last played activity for easy shortcuts. The Apps tab is what you can use for launching your apps. In the Settings tab, go to Library and select Clear Disjointed Items on Sync. Then scroll down and click Disable Player Warnings. Always show Sync icon is a preference. Back out and head to the Appearance section and download Platform Wallpapers Pack. I like Alec Fool NX, but feel free to spend a day looking at all the options. 
Download the pack and move on to navigation, which again is personal preference, but I prefer to start Daijisho on the Platforms tab. Head to Video and Sounds, and for me, I disable these. Go back and into Backup and Restore. Set up backing up and restoring by using your Google Drive account and clicking Automatically Backup. Forgot to show it, but make sure you set up Retro Achievements as well on that settings page. Now let's set Daijisho as our home app and what the device will always boot into and use as our front end. Go to Android Settings, Apps, Default Apps, Home App, and select Daijisho. Go back into Daijisho and head to the Platforms tab. Now you want to point each platform to where your ROMs are held. So click Paths, Add More, and find your folder. Repeat this for each platform. Also, Daijisho is pretty good about auto-detecting, but you want to make sure it's using the right emulator to boot into. Click the pencil icon bottom right and scroll down to default player. Click the arrow on the right to avoid the keyboard popping up and make sure the selection matches the core we have installed. We in GameCube could get confusing, so see here for the right selection for Dolphin MMJR. Click Save to save your choice. And that's the video. If you followed along, you should have everything set up nicely and with minimal tweaking needed on a game by game basis after this. The next week is going to be a bit hectic for me, but plan on having my actual review of the RG405M up within the next two weeks. So keep an eye out for that as my next video. As always, hope you liked the video and hope you all have a good one.